the Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to CarryLutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. This show is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been selling gold and silver for 22 years. And I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. For more information, go to milesfranklin.com or call them at 800-822-8080. Fourteen ninety WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz. You're listening to the Financial Survival Network. And if you're wondering where this total breakdown in morality has come from, why everybody seems to be in it for themselves without any regard to the future, Dana Metter is with us. She's from WealthShift.org, and she's here to explain why the U.S. must change or go through some horrible times ahead. She's a CPA and has been a consultant to ultra-high net worth individuals for the past 20 years. And Dana, welcome to the Financial Survival Network. We're so pleased to have you on. Thanks, Gary. So you believe that the U.S. is in an extremely precarious financial position, don't you? Well, I actually believe we've gone past the tipping point. Um, but uh, yes, we are in a horribly precarious position. And when you say the tipping point, what do you mean by that? The tipping point comes when you know the things that people do and the way they do them become so embedded in the culture that there's no way to bring it back absent a crisis. And we're in that crisis now, aren't we? Absolutely. So I think that these crises are good times to learn about yourself and about society. And also, they provide an opportunity to change things that really is absent in the absence of a crisis. As, as one of the president's advisors has said, uh, never let a crisis go to waste. So what do we do here in this well, uh, crisis? I think we have to recognize that we have what's called a paradox, paradox of ethics in that everybody wants to point the finger at somebody else and say, you're the one who lacks ethics. So if you ask the average person, do you, are you ethical? Are you an ethical person? The average person says, absolutely, I'm a totally ethical person. And then you ask that same person, how many of your coworkers or people you know, your neighbors, the politicians, the ba banksters, how many of those people are ethical? Well, nobody is. You know, so I'm ethical, but nobody else is. And you have to start looking at your own behavior and start analyzing your own behavior and saying, what am I doing to contribute to this problem? Because only by knowing those things and being able to figure out why we've done what we've done and why we're doing what we're doing you know, once this currency re reset occurs, you know, then we have to be able to say, okay, well, I'm not going to do that thing that I did before that wasn't productive. Right. So, but what you're saying here is teaching people, educating them. And how do you really teach people morality, especially adults, CEOs, and business people who've, you know, are, are grown up and have had their whole life to establish this pattern? Because I don't believe they're unethical behavior just appeared the day that they got promoted. It's part of a pattern. Right. And I also don't think they understand that there's any percentage in acting any differently. I mean, what amazes me is that the companies that have that are ethically driven, like, for example, Chipotle Grill, um, SC Johnson and Company, uh, the companies that if you look on the best companies to work for in America, those are some of the most profitable, amazing companies in the country, and they command the greatest share price. So there's a huge percentage in being ethical, in doing things the right way, but for some reason there's a breakdown. And I, and I think it all goes back to the way CEOs are compensated. So long about 1980, what ended up happening was managers who used to be managers and offer that intermediary between shareholders and workers, those people started getting compensated like shareholders and not only shareholders, but shareholders that only had to own the company's stock for a very short amount of time. So consequently, what ended up happening was they started maximizing very short term goals instead of longer term goals. And that ended up costing, you know, everything that we've seen happen 
if you maximize those short-term goals, you're going to get the end product that you've seen in a lot of the companies that we're seeing today. Look, look today, just today, Aubrey McClendon, it was found out that he borrowed $1 billion from Chesapeake Energy. Brilliant. You know, what business does he have borrowing a billion dollars from Chesapeake Energy when they're already, you know, cash poor? It just, it just smacks of, you know, something very unethical. It might not be illegal, but it's incredibly unethical. And so the message he sends to all the people who work for Chesapeake is Aubrey McClendon gets his first. Mm -hmm. So you think that CEOs are overcompensated because their capital, for the most part, unless they own a large percentage of the company's stock, isn't at risk. It's the shareholders' capital who's at risk, and the shareholders used to come first. There was a fiduciary obligation on the part of management to put shareholder interest first and then compensate themselves, but that's become topsy-turvy, I guess. Well, it used to be that managers served that intermediary duty so that both the worker needs were met and the shareholder needs were net met. And that person served the fiduciary duty to make sure that both sides of the coin, you know, their interests were served. And the companies that fail to do that invariably run aground financially. Gerald Arpey, who is the CEO of American Airlines, he sat there on... Um, 2020 or whatever uh, interview talking about how poorly compensated he was and how he didn't make very much money. And when you drill deeper, you found out he made a lot of money. But at the same point, you know, he had cars and planes and all these things at his disposal, club memberships, just the whole raft of things you see CEOs getting. Um, but at the same time, he's negotiating with the pilots to take pay cuts, you know, and the service people to take pay cuts and talking about how he doesn't make very much money. And so, you know, later on down the line, it's no wonder, here we are, American Airlines is completely bankrupt. Um, so, you know, you, you can contrast those companies where the CEOs talk a good game, but really when you drill deeper down into it, you find out they really are putting themselves first. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and it just does, does a tremendous disservice to everybody involved. Because the other thing you end up seeing is you end up seeing the the people who work for the company doing all sorts of things they wouldn't be doing. They, um, you know, take long lunch breaks or if they work at McDonald's, they grab a bag of, you know, burgers on their way out the door because these, I, you know, wealth shift is mono a mono. You know, it's like, hey, if I take a bag of hamburgers on the way out the door, how does that possibly compare with my direct supervisor who's riding around in a company provided car for his own personal benefit. You know, I mean, there's just no comparison between what I'm doing here as a lowly little worker and what you're doing, you know, and the perks you get and the perks I get. Well, so then it just becomes this rampant wealth shifting, wealth shift a thon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if you remember, Dana, years ago, people used to stay with the same company their whole lives, they'd retire. They'd get a gold watch and they would get a pension. And somehow, I don't know if that was the right model, that kind of uh, corporate paternalism for the employees, but people believed in the company and they would make sacrifices when times were tough and they would share when times got better. And then somehow that model just broke down and it became all about, like you said, what's the next quarter going to look like? How do we maximize our profits to jack the price of the stock up, up, jack the price of the stock up so that we can cash in on our stock options. And the whole thing just looked like it became motivated by greed and self-interest rather than putting anything ahead. And the more the government stepped in, the less responsibility the companies thought they had. So for example, Social Security, when Social Security came into being, it's supplemental income. It's, it was never supposed to replace pension plans, but it has. And personal savings, yeah. And yeah, and personal savings. But, you know, uh, health care, you know, I, I just see the handwriting on the, uh, on the wall. You know, health care is a big burden for corporations. So if they can abdicate their responsibility 
for, you know, making that part of a person's compensation, then, you know, the next step is, you know, there won't be any health care anywhere for anyone unless you're on the public, uh, some public plan. Yeah. And, you know, the whole prescription drug push during the Bush administration was largely about cost shifting, about big corporations being able to dump their retiree health costs onto the government. GM was there. The biggest corporations were just trying to reduce retiree health costs. That's why that thing went through. Nobody really wanted it. There wasn't this groundswell of support for socialized drug benefits. And yet the corporations wanted it to reduce the drag on future and current earnings. And that's why it went through. But the next question is, how do you, what should you be telling your kids about this? How do you put values forth that your children will find appealing and acceptable and internalize? Well, my kids are both entrepreneurs. You know, they're in their 20s. They're doing their own thing. You know, they they know this. They know that you have to excel and exceed, you know, beyond what, uh, you know, society has historically said was acceptable. And, you know, a lot of people have really abdicated their responsibility for stepping up to the plate and being that 1% of humanity that actually is going to survive this whole debacle. Because if you think, you know, you can just be what everybody else is and it's going to be okay, or you can only, you only need to have the financial knowledge that everybody else has, which is zero, (laughs) and you're somehow going to make it through you know, it is it is beyond me how people have abdicated responsibility for everything to do with their life. And they sit around, you know, trying to figure out ways to wealth shift. And instead of sitting around thinking about ways to get, you know, the next thing, well, let me see, how can I uh, take out more credit cards so I can rack up more credit card debt so that I, my default can be bigger, but I can get through another month. That's the focus. That's the thought. You know, how can I strategically default on the, this house mortgage? Because I took out this mortgage on this huge house that I can't afford. So how do I go through all of this? Do I kite? Do I, you know, I mean, it's just all, everything, everything that people allocate their daily thoughts to is so wrong and so unethical. And it's all why this thing's going to come cratering down. So what I tell my kids is, you know, you have to be thinking about your legacy. It's all about legacy. If you die tomorrow, you know, what are people going to think about you? And how are people going to remember you? And I look at these CEOs and I will tell you my clients, oh my gosh, they're just the best people. So not everybody in the top 1% are jerks and assholes and banksters. There are some really great people out there. When my husband got sick, my client went and found him the best neurosurgeon in the world to do the surgery. So, you know, there are people out there who care about the people that work for them and with them and help them grow and become. One of the people I really admire is Fisk Johnson, who is the CEO of SC Johnson and Company. It's privately held. But that man has on his campus, he has a university. And if you are on the lower rungs of the corporate ladder, you can actually decide a path for yourself. Go take the classes you need at the university there, and then they will slot you in to that level. So they don't have attrition. They don't have employees leaving. You know, there's a huge giant mistake that CEOs make out there, which is that I'll just throw this fish back and get a better fish because there's so many people in the labor pool. But the likelihood of you getting a fish just like the fish you had is very high. Mm -hmm. So you have to work with what you've got and mentor and legacy build. So when I talk to my kids and I try to, you know, I try to help them think. And I and I think people have to stop thinking the same way they've always been thought to think. For example, one of the things that is coming up and I can see it as clear as day is we are topping out in the stock market and you're going to start to see a pullback, especially if you see stuff going wrong in Europe. You're going to start seeing this pullback. And what are people going to do? What would, what do the vast majority of people do? They rush into cash. And this time around, rushing to cash is the absolute worst thing you can do. So, you know, like I was in um, Vancouver and we went out in a boat to see the the orcas you know swimming around and we went to a sea lion rookery 
And there were all these sea lions lounging around on the rocks. And I thought, you know, that that orc is going to go without a meal today because all these sea lions are up there on the rocks. But then one by one, they all started getting scared. And then this next thing you knew, they were all jumping in the water. And I and I asked the guy, you know, why are they jumping in the water? That's the worst thing they can be doing is jumping in the water. And he said, because that's where they feel comfortable. That's where they don't, you know, they can maneuver in the water. And sure enough, the orca came along and grabbed one of them. And it was a Scooby snack, you know, right (laughs) then and there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I agree that uh, group behavior going with the crowd is usually a recipe for disaster and hoping that the whale is going to get your neighbor instead of you is not a prescription for financial health. But we've also got this breakdown, not just in the U.S., but in the world, in the rule of law. The U.S. used to be a nation of laws, not men, but now we seem to be a lawless society. How do we, how do, we do a, a moral shift for the country? How do we get people to understand that uh, without the rule of law, nobody is safe and we're all potentially at risk? That's what well, I want to understand. I, I, I hear that, too. And here's the thing. <clears throat> there are so many people out there right now who don't understand that there already is no rule of law. I have a, a friend who's an attorney. And, you know, when the subprime crisis hit, one of the things that people decided they were going to do is run out and sue their financial advisors and the banks and whoever else. And they are so backlogged in the courts that they will never get heard. I mean, you know, the the backlog of subprime litigation is a mile deep. And if you think you're going to get satisfaction, you are just whistling Dixie because it, you know, the the court process is going to take at least 15 years on this thing. And the next crisis is going to come long before that happens. Oh, yeah. And, and who can so, afford the litigation? And who can afford the litigation? Long. And yeah. another thing, you know, I think people have to really get out of what they're used to and start thinking about the paradigm sh- shift that's happening. Because a lot of people think, for example, you know, they say, well, I'll, you know, I'll buy some gold and I'll buy some silver and, you know, and but they expect to be able to call their stockbroker and make a trade. On the same day that people are lining up, you know, in front of the grocery store to stock the, you know, I'm just, I, I, I'm baffled by, um, by people's thought processes that they actually think that if this whole thing really goes down, that they're going to somehow, there's going to be some record somewhere of some share that they own. I don't know if you've tried to get shares certificated. But it's impossible. Do that anymore? It's virtually impossible. I tried to get some serious shares. I mean, big number of shares of a major publicly traded company certificated. Couldn't do it. Could not do it. They're held in street name by brokerage companies, and you can't get them certificated. It's all electronic. Your ownership of all those things is electronic. And if you trust it, and if you believe in it, and you know, knowing that, if you continue to hold shares. That's fine, but at least know what you're holding. My gosh, and the fa- and you know the risk you're taking holding it. Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, a little bit scary. Is that the whole world's wealth is a bunch of bits and bytes on computer disks, and the system we've seen uh, there's a fragility to it, and there's a point where it collapses, where it can't sustain itself any longer, and then where are you? You know, it's the cash in your pocket. And the the gold, hopefully, and the silver that you put away. But, you know, this this is a problem. And the other question is, when the system is so corrupt, how does it purge itself? How, how do you cure a system that really is corrupt to the core? And obviously, it requires the consent of the majority of people to, to change. And what makes them willing to change? because they think they're getting what they want now. Well, I think I think it's amazing, you know, that the I believe that the core of of American values is good. I believe that what we were taught is good. I believe that people really really want to pursue a nobler path. They just don't want to go first, you know. And I can't, I mean, why should I be ethical if nobody else is ethical? But I think Hobson's choice. (laughs) If everyone else is going to screw everyone, then do I sit around and get screwed or do I just go, you know, screw them before they screw me? Yes, exactly. And I think we're going to see a huge Darwinian flush. 
And I mean that across the board. And I'm not talking about eugenics or some planned kill off or anything like that. I'm talking about we have allowed companies to survive that should have been allowed to fail. We've allowed people to believe that they, you know, can we have 89 million people on some form of government assistance. Amazing. And we've allowed that to perpetuate. We've allowed that to happen. And I think the get real moment is when all of that stuff goes away, you're left to your own cleverness, your own devices, what you what you think. And the percentage comes not from uh, doing what everybody else has been doing and towing the line, but the percentage comes in thinking outside the box and knowing how to think outside the box. Which so, most people, but most people, Dana, can't do that. I They've know. They've never done it in their lives. And, and our educational system, our so-called educational system, has not prepared them to do that ever. And, and expectations-wise, they haven't had parents or a family that expected this type of thought process out of them. And their schools, the schools are just designed to to basically train good soldiers and good factory workers. But that purpose, you know, it goes back to the old Prussian educational system in the end of the 1800s. And that one has definitely failed us. So really what you're saying is we need a nation of free thinkers. And if you want to survive and thrive in what's coming ahead, you got to start thinking for yourself. And And so many people don't even think it's important because, you know, the average person has a net worth of $6,000. So that average person, you know, sees all this stuff. If you talk to a hairdresser or a yard man or, you know, any of these people, the people who work, you know, at the fast food places, they know it's coming. Everybody knows this is coming. But the thing is, they just say, well, how does this affect me? And how could I possibly prepare for this? Because I don't have any money. I live with my parents, blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever the story sure. is. Oh, yeah. And, you know, those people don't even want to get it. And they won't get it. And so to expect that this crisis is going to happen peacefully, you know, without any social backlash whatsoever, you know, the nine, 89 million people who are on the dole are, are hushed up, quiet and happy. You know, they're not happy, but they're they're putting up with it. But the day comes that stops. Mm-hmm. All those people are going to be occupying everything they can occupy. And yeah. I think that's what the government is preparing for. It wouldn't surprise me at all. In fact, I kind of wish they would. I hope they are because, mm. you know, the rest of us won't have a shot in the dark if, you know, the few of us who are prepared are overwhelmed by the people who have not prepared at all. Yeah, this is a, this is a conundrum for all of us that we really, you really need to face the facts that the potential for this collapse, and we're not just talking in the U.S., we're talking really in the whole world, has the potential to occur. This is what Alexander Hamilton feared more than anything else was anarchy and chaos. And it's nice to theorize what a great world would it would be without any government and how evil our government has become. But you really do rely on the government for a lot of basic functions that aren't going to be there for you. So, well, I, and anybody who yeah. thinks that they can they can leave the United States and go somewhere else, or that they should take their money and put it somewhere else, those people are nuts, Carrie. Absolutely nuts, because. Switzerland made their wealth off the absconded wealth of the Russians and the German Jews. I mean, my God, do you not know history? It just came up a few years ago in New York State. They paid out billions of dollars because the Holocaust survivors' families went to them and said, you know, so-and-so had an insurance policy with you and we'd like to get paid. And they say, oh, no problem. Let's see a death certificate. Exactly. Well, I don't have one because... yeah. And eventually, yeah. eventually they paid big time and they got a black eye over it. But but expecting the banking establishment to safeguard your wealth when there's turmoil is probably probably a big mistake. Or to move to Mexico when you don't speak Spanish or to move to China when you don't look Chinese. You know, um, people don't understand how um, little Americans are liked in the rest of the world. They slap on a really pretty face when you're paying money out as a tourist, 
But let me tell you, they have no use for you if you have no money. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that that I think is absolutely some people need to really focus on is that the United States, once we get past bankruptcy, is a great place to live. Our demographics are so much better than anywhere else in and, the world. And water and, and water, natural and, resources and, and weather. And infrastructure and housing you know, and everything we, you know, people who say you need to get out of the United States, they don't understand that, you know, I have, been, I have had walked clients through bankruptcy and I'm telling you, you know, when you're on the verge of bankruptcy, everything looks black, but then you get through it. And on the other side, you're debt free. Yeah. Hey, and I know I'm writing so much better. I'm writing a paper right now, short paper, but I've I've been involved in bankruptcy and creditors' rights for many, many years as an attorney, and the title of the paper is The Coming Golden Age of Municipal Bankruptcy, because what these municipalities will be able to do is get rid of all these labor contracts, get rid of the pensions. They'll even be able to dissolve school systems and just hand out vouchers and say, go get your own education, which is probably not such a bad idea. And there's a lot of things that are coming that people are totally not clued in about. But as far as uh, you, Dana, what's next for you? Um, Well, for me, I I kind of take a two prong approach. You have to have a foot in this world and a foot in the next world. So, you know, for me, I, you know, I still have to do my duty to my clients, still have to file those tax returns and advise these people. Mm -hmm. Then I have to thread this needle. And I think, you know, if you try to carve your future too much in stone, you're going to be shocked by something and you might get flushed out. So I think it's really important to just kind of say, okay, Here's the basic overall game plan, okay? You have to, anybody who thinks that they, you know, don't need a house to live in or shouldn't be debt-free because they're going to get their debts inflated away from them, they've looked at places where, uh, the communist nations that went bankrupt. So, you know, wages inflated along with the debt and everybody had a party. Well, that's not going to happen in the United States. In the United States, our wages are going to remain flat while inflation is going to go through the roof. So there's a there's a two prong approach to this. We're either going to have hyperinflation, you know, where slowly over time and with greater rapidity, we get more and more money printing and then the debts go away. But wages are stagnating. Wages aren't going anywhere. So a lot of people are going to get flushed out of their homes. They're going to get flushed out of their apartments. So you have to do what you have to do now to scale back and get your cash flow under control because a lot of people's cash flow is completely under control. My home, I own free and clear. My cars are free and clear. And people say, you know, that's nuts. You know, that's just going to get floated away from you. Why don't you have a lot of debt? Because I do not believe that that is the true scenario. So I think the thing is you have to, uh, uh, for myself, cash flow skinny. I require about $10,000 a year. Absolutely. You know, just in terms of taxes and water and electricity. That's all I absolutely have to have because I've also stockpiled what I need to live on a daily basis. So people who are out there buying, um, you know, gold and silver, all that's really good. But you know what? You you need first, you have to secure the farm. Mm -hmm. You need first to have, you know, what you need covered. And the thing about that is it's it's kind of cool because people who start on that, who start stockpiling and stuff, people that I talked into stockpiling toilet paper in 2007 are living on the most wonderful toilet paper, while people who are just now buying toilet paper are like, have you noticed that <laughs> the center roll is like a lot bigger and there are fewer sheets and mm-hmm. the sheets are really thin and it takes about 10 of them, you know, to do the job. Uh, that's inflation. And, And it's hidden inflation. So, you know, they get, um, I think, behavior that's reinforced is behavior that moves to the next level. So start doing things that will help reinforce those behaviors. So, you know, like if you buy those things, don't go out and buy meat and put it in a freezer. You know, heck, that's, you know, going to rot. Go buy the non-perishables. Go buy the things that are going to get inflated away and buy them smart. Buy them on the internet. Buy them through Amazon.com. Don't go to your grocery store and pay p- full price. That's just crazy. You know, do do what you need to do to try to buy these things on sale because they will go up. Even if nothing else happens, those things are going to go up in price. They're going up as we speak as well as, as we fuel. we speak. 
And and there's also better places to be in the U.S. than others. Probably not being in the middle of a major city uh, where half the two thirds of the inhabitants are on some form of public assistance. Probably not a bad idea. Being in Texas or North Dakota or other states where energy production is big, where resources are a primary employer, also a, probably a good thing. And that's all part of our financial survival plan, which uh, people can get if they go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com. And uh, Dana, where do people, if they want to learn more about you, what you're doing, where can they find you? Um, well, Wealth Shift, which I, I encourage everybody to read that book. It is an absolute primer on you know, how we got where we got, why we've gotten where we've got, and you know, how little it would take to convert this country to a legacy building mentality if we really set our mind to it. So it's kind of like a blueprint for wh where we should go after this whole currency reset happens. And then also I blog on don't-tread-on.me. I know that's kind of a <laughs> difficult thing, to, but yeah, um, and I know we've got so a link to it. We've got a link to it. And uh, if you send and listen us to Chris yeah. Dwayne, listen to Kyle Bass, Listen to Jim Rickards, listen to, you know, you and Chris Masterson and the people who talk really great logical sense. Don't listen to Alex Jones. Don't listen to these people who are just so far out there. You know, I mean, seriously, you need to not get worked up. You need to be developing a plan. That is first and foremost. The plan comes first. The plan to protect whatever wealth you've managed to retain the plan to keep your family unit intact and to survive through whatever is going to happen. The odds are it'll happen pretty quickly. We'll start recovering from it fairly quickly because you can't uh, go on. You can't continue modern life without a monetary unit. Impossible. Cannot be done. And so they're going to have to put together a system. And my feeling is it's going to be based on something have some type of link to metal. There's no other way, no other system has worked over time, and we're just going to prove history yet again. So, yes, Dan absolutely. You know, you, it, it, after bankruptcy, the thing is, people have, it, when you go in to, you know, get a loan or whatever, they want collateral. So, on the aftermath of this, the United States is not going to de be developing a currency or be able to be develop a currency that doesn't have some form of collateral banking, mm -hmm. some sort of thing that is there that they can pledge as an asset, whether it's gold or silver or our oil or mineral interests. But the thing that's portable, the thing that we can use to settle our balances of trade with are precious metals. So, it yeah. totally makes sense. Yep. So it's part of the strategy. It's not the plan, but it's a good part of the plan. And on that note, uh, Dana, we've got to get going, but uh, people can find you at wealthshift.org and download your free book, which is really great. And we will have you on again soon. You be well. Thank you, Gary.